Hello, and welcome to Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, Director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Thursday, October 13th, 2022. And at the very beginning of the show today, I unfortunately would like to give some very sad news, um, but also um, a very warm memory. And that's that we at IJ lost someone very dear to us, uh, a member of our team over the weekend, unexpectedly. And that's a member of our communications team, uh, Connor Beck. Uh, Connor was a young man who had been with us, uh, nevertheless, a few years and had warmed so many hearts of us at IJ had talked to many uh, IJ clients and members of the media and done his best to spread the message of liberty. Um, And it is a deep and tragic loss to us at IJ, to his family, to his many friends. And so we just want to state that we remember you, Connor, uh, and we're going to miss you. And for everyone who was touched by him, um, may his memory be a blessing. We're going to move on now for our short circuit. And we've had a good time the last couple of weeks on the road. We uh, enjoyed meeting the Columbia Law students last week, and I hope all of you listeners enjoyed that show with uh, our friends David Latz and Mike Yeager. We had a lot of fun there in um, Morningside Heights uh, in Manhattan. We're going to have even more fun in a couple of weeks at our Short Circuit Live that we've talked about on the show before, but it is getting close now. So if you live in the New York City area and you're interested in coming to Short Circuit Live, now is the time to RSVP so we know how many um, appetizers and drinks to have at the uh, at the Short Circuit Live. Although we will be taking walk-ins uh, also as space allows. That'll uh, be at a venue in the Financial District on Wednesday, October 26th. And we have the link in the show notes, show notes for you to RSVP. So we look forward to meeting many of you there. Now, one person who will be there is our own Patrick Giacomo, who, among many other things, is our musical consultant here on Short Circuit. So, Patrick, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks, Anthony. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person in New York. That is true. He's speaking to all of you, not me, because I won't be there. It will be hosted by our good friend, uh, Anya Bidwell, who uh, helps Patrick. um, Actually, Patrick helps her um, direct our project on immunity and accountability. But also joining us today for the first time is uh, one of IJ's fellows, a, um, a new attorney with us, Anna Goodman. So, Anna, welcome to Short Circuit. Thanks so much, Anthony. I'm excited to be here today. And Patrick, it's great to be with you guys. Well, we're looking forward to hearing about a uh, a, a new case from both of them. Patrick has a case from the Fifth Circuit, a Fourth Amendment case. And Anna has a case from the First Circuit, which once again is written, unfortunately, in courier font. Um, but we're not going to go down the path of talking about fonts uh, again. We've We'll do that again sometime, but not today. So, uh, Patrick, let's begin in the Fifth Circuit with Crane versus City of Arlington. Yeah, so this is a tragic case out of Arlington, Texas. Uh, It's probably more aptly called uh, Crane versus Craig Roper, who's a police officer at the center of what happened here. Um, And this case involves uh, kind of a lot of things at the intersection of of why policing can go wrong in very tragic ways um, and how a lot of court doctrines essentially can can underlie those uh, tragedies. And so in this case, uh, we start from the premise that the United States Supreme Court has approved the use of pretextual stops by police officers across the country um, under Fourth Amendment principles. And so this means, as many people already know, that police, if they can find some minor traffic infraction that they believe you've committed, they can stop you. And that sort of opens a whole Pandora's box of all the things that come next. Um, It doesn't matter whether they had a bad reason for stopping you or no reason for stopping you until they found a reason, which um, there have been several viral videos lately where police say this openly. They can find a reason to pull you over. The problem is we have Too many minor laws that allow officers to engage with citizens, which inevitably, as that number goes up, so will 
um, the number of incidents that uh, that escalate to violence, unfortunately, and this is one of those cases. And so here around midnight, uh, a man named Tavis Crane was driving a car with a friend in the front seat. In the back seat uh, were, were his pregnant girlfriend and his two-year-old daughter. Um, an officer for the Arlington Police Department named Elsie Bowden uh, pulled up behind Mr. Crane and saw something thrown out the window of the car, which for some reason she believed to be a crack pipe. Um, so she pulled the car over um, and went up and investigated and realized as she was standing at the car's uh, passenger window and the two-year-old in the back seat threw the top of a plastic candy cane out the window that what she'd seen thrown out the window was the plastic bottom of the candy cane toy, something we're all very familiar with. Um, Officer Bowden um, recognized that, but instead of simply saying, oops, uh, this was just a misunderstanding, everyone go on about your way, she decided to uh, run all the numbers. And in doing so, she discovered that there were five misdemeanor warrants out for Mr. Crane and potentially a felony probation warrant, although that was never actually confirmed. While all this was going on and she was radioing, other officers showed up, uh, one of them named Craig Roper, who's the main defendant in this case. And by all accounts here, and again, we're taking the facts in the light most favorable to the plaintiff here, uh, Roper was the, some sort of hothead, hotshot type police officer whose first impulse was to immediately use physical force. And so um, despite being brushed back by both Officer Bowden and others on the scene, uh, Roper time and again did that. And in this case, uh, that manifested in the following way. Once the officers found the warrants for Mr. Crane, they told him to get out of the car. He refused. He said he needed to take his daughter home to her mother. Um, and he didn't know what these warrants were for. And furthermore, the police couldn't actually tell him that information. So he essentially refused to get out of the car. Um, in response to this, for some reason, Officer Roper uh, pulled out his gun, climbed into the back seat of the car over the pregnant woman, uh, put Mr. Crane into a chokehold and put the gun uh, back uh, behind him, continued to shout at him while Officer Bowden was trying to get Officer Roper to get out of the car. Um, and at some point um, in the chokehold scenario, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Crane pushed down on the accelerator in the car and it went backwards. Um, and based on the passenger's testimony, that was after uh, Officer Roper shot uh, Mr. Crane two times and then two more times, a total of four times at point blank range, killing him um, and causing the car to move, um, thereby explaining the Fifth Circuit statement in this case that a two-year-old girl threw a candy cane out a window and 25 minutes later her father would be dead. Um, to further underscore the legal doctrines like the pretextual stops that allow for this sort of uh, escalation to occur, we have both the doctrine of qualified immunity, which was asserted by um, Officer Roper in this case and ultimately denied, thankfully, by the Fifth Circuit, though it was awarded by the district court here, which um, looked at the, the facts in the light most favorable to the officer in doing so and basically said that no reasonable jury could um, accept the plaintiff's statement of facts. And the other one, uh, which is it comes out the wrong way in the Fifth Circuit, is that when police look at the or when courts look at the use of excessive force in the Fifth Circuit and several others, they view as irrelevant any any actions taken by police that caused the escalation of the force in the first place. So other circuits in the tenth, for instance, they will look at everything that led up to the use of deadly force. In the fifth circuit, they just look at a snapshot of the moment. And so they're not considering the unnecessary climbing into the car and pointing the gun and the other reasonable officers telling Roper to get out of the car. All they look at is the use of force in the moment. And even with that context here, the Fifth Circuit still said this is excessive force. And thankfully, they also lean on the obviousness exception um, to qualified immunity here and say that we have uh, these broad principles that say you can't use um, violent or deadly force on um, on a, fel a fleeing felon unless they're a threat to you or others uh, in a serious way. And here that wasn't the case based on the plaintiff's statement of facts. So we ultimately get the right result in this case. But unfortunately, we're still living in a world where all these standards allow for and in many ways incentivize this sort of policing, where we have a stop that never even needed to occur, was extended uh, to find additional crimes because it was pretextual. And then you have an officer who escalates it to deadly violence um, and kills a man in the street in Arlington, Texas. 
Um, and there's just no way to unring that bell, even if this case does get to go forward. And so this is sort of the state of affairs that we live in now. Um, and, uh, you know, to people who can't imagine themselves in the situation, you know, a lot of people who do thought that about themselves until they did. Um, and so this this is something we should all be very concerned about because it essentially um, is predicated on the very flippant violation of our Fourth Amendment rights that occurs on a daily basis, thanks to the myriad uh, laws and regulations that allow police to interact with us, which is kind of going to be a theme, I think, on this call, though we're not dealing with police in the second case. We're dealing with more sprawling uh, regulations and laws that essentially allow for um, a lot of misbehavior. Ana, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's such a tragic, I was reading it a little bit before we got on here this morning, and Patrick, that case is just one that speaks so loudly about the issues that are here. Do you think, does the Fifth Circuit's refusing to imply qualified immunity here, does that at all signal maybe a hopeful sea change, or is, do we think this is a one time that it was egregious enough that they were willing to take that into account? I think this has more to do with this particular case and this particular panel than it is a signal that the court is changing gears on this. I mean, another case just came out where police tased an unarmed man um, and the Fifth Circuit panel in that case gave the police a pass. So I, I don't think we can read into anything more broadly than that, unfortunately, but uh, it's, it's always possible. Yeah, I would say this is just about the best panel you could want in the Fifth Circuit if you're trying to have qualified immunity tonight with uh, Judge Higginbottom uh, Botham wrote it. Uh, it was a very good opinion. But then uh, Judge Dennis and Graves, who are are two two of the the more likely um, to to find fault in, in a case like this, uh, joining him. Um, what what struck me, Patrick? Well, first a question: um, so you knowing much more the ins and outs of qualified immunity than I do. This idea that you only look at use of force in the moment and not you know, I don't know, the two minutes leading up to it or, or the, the, the background of the situation. How is what is the justification for for doing that? It just sounds so alien to, you know, how you would consider any kind of constitutional violation. Yeah. So, I mean, this is obviously more of a first a Fourth Amendment um, issue than a qualified immunity issue. But yeah, it is frustrating. And it kind of stems from the fact that the Supreme Court has articulated this objective standard uh, when looking at reasonableness. And so I guess the, the logic goes that you have to look at the moment of the shooting to decide whether an objective officer facing those circumstances uh, would have reasonably believed that they could have met the standards for the use of deadly force. Um, of course, the counterpoint, as you can probably draw up in your own mind, and the Tenth Circuit has explained, is that you know that reasonable officer would have also been the officer who brought the moment to that to that. Uh, apex. And so they should have thought that through before they escalated everything to that point. You know, kind of similar to the fact that you can't assert self-defense when you're the one who's created um, the the danger that you're now defending right. yourself against. My uh, uh, takeaway from, from this case isn't so much the qualified immunity bit, although um, I, I like the bottom line of what the court did, but that it yeah, you're from what you said, Patrick. It, this is a situation that never needed to to happen. Um, you know, people have outstanding, as as we know now, it, because this has become more of an issue. Um, people have outstanding warrants for all kinds of reasons. Often, it's not for paying a traffic ticket, and then you get something in the mail saying you haven't paid. Um, this happens in many states. If you don't pay within thirty days, there'll be a warrant issued for your arrest, um, and a lot of people for whatever reason, don't pay their traffic ticket. Of course, they should pay their traffic ticket, but if they don't um, and there's a warrant issued for your arrest, does that mean that this kind of situation should result from that? Um, you know, my thought when when this when this cop is running um, his name in the, in the car registry to see if there's anything outstanding, and there is, why, it, and this was at, I think, 11.30 at night or, or something like that, why is the solution to call for backup and arrest the driver when there's other people in the car? And you know, there's all kinds of details I could go into here. But just, just, just thinking of this situation, there's other people in the car. They're going to have to fight, either drive the car home or find their own on the way home. There's a two-year-old child in the car. Why isn't the solution to, to go to the guy's house the next day? And arrest him then if he has these outstanding warrants. Why do we have to do it right now and at night with several cops with guns? 
uh, I don't understand why in in um, police training that they think that this is a good idea. Yeah, this has been a consistently perplexing issue. And obviously, it's been something we've been talking about a lot since Breonna Taylor was killed. And you have so many scenarios like this. And, you know, there's this one. There's the why are we using raids at all if we could just wait to arrest the person when they went to go to the grocery store um, or any number of other examples like that. And I frankly don't know because even if you look at this purely from the perspective of officer safety, the officers would be much more safe if that's how they addressed it. Why would you want to deal with this on the side of the road at midnight in this case? Or why would you want to deal with uh, the alleged crimes underlying Breonna Taylor's house raid with a raid as opposed to just waiting for someone to leave the house? I have no idea what the actual answer is. But I do think another thing, too, is that, you know, at least as the Fifth Circuit tells the story, you know, Elsie Bowden, the officer who made the stop, you know, she was just kind of doing the normal thing here. And I don't think that she thought she was doing anything bad. But you realize that, you know, the fact that this is the the modus operandi for most police departments across the country allows for officers like Roper to inject themselves in the situation, even if the first impulse of someone like Officer Bowden is to not escalate to violence. Um, and so you just realize that by putting all of these officers in so many scenarios where they're in conflict with uh, people that they don't need to be, you're putting them in danger and you're putting people in danger. And I can't really see the upside in most instances. Well, another case where it seems like nobody was in danger in any way, but nevertheless, it's still a case, uh, is... Uh, on his case, uh, that's Lawfer versus Atchison. So, um, Anna, uh, it seems like this this woman, Deborah Lawfer, she is very good at going to court. Um, and so, give us a little bit of background about her, about why she's suing this uh, hotel in Maine. Yes. Yeah, so, our plaintiff in this case, Deborah Lawfer, is an interesting individual. She is a self proclaimed tester. And what that means is so she is an individual that falls within the protection of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And she has taken it upon herself to go out and to find organization entities that are not in compliance with some portion of the ADA and then to file suit based on that. And so, that's what happened in this case is in this case, the suit was filed against Atchison Hotels, LLC, and Atchison runs um, the Coast Village Inn and Cottages up in Maine. It owns that. And Deborah went online. She looked at the Coast Inn's website and looked at, she didn't actually want to stay there. She had never had any interest in that. Um, like I said, she actually has hundreds of suits pending across the United States and a couple of the suits and other circuits that we'll talk about and that the court talks about in this opinion are actually suits where she was also the named plaintiff in those cases, uh, which just kind of shows you that she's prolific uh, in what she's done. But she went online and looked at if she was going to book a room, whether or not the website was compliant with the ADA's requirement that there has to be accessibility information listed on the website. And there wasn't that on either the Coast Inn's website or the third-party booking website. I believe there's about 13 of those she looked at. So based on that, she filed this suit um, seeking declaratory injunctive relief and basically saying, hey, you have to have this information on there per the ADA. Um, and Atchison responded by filing a motion to dismiss based on a lack of subject matter jurisdiction, effectively pointing to her status as a tester and saying, look, she never wanted to stay here. She was never coming here. She just went online, found this and used this as a basis for suit. Um, and the district court agreed with them and dismissed the case and uh, Ms. Lover appealed. And that's how we got to the First Circuit and to the opinion in this case. So... It's an interesting setup for sure, uh, based on that. Um, and in the First Circuit, the court really focused a lot looking at kind of the history of development around in informational injury. And they really key in on one case in particular after laying the framework for um, standing and talking about what exactly is an injury in fact. They focused in on this case called Havens Realty Corp versus Coleman, which was a 1982 Supreme Court decision involving um, an apartment complex. And in that case, there was a, a 
another tester involved who went into this apartment complex and was a minority and went several times and asked, hey, are there apartments available for rent? And was repeatedly told, no, there are no apartments here for you. Um, and then another individual who was not a minority came in, asked the same question and was told, yeah, we have apartments you can rent here. Uh, a suit was filed in that case and pretty much the a parallel issue uh, came up where they, the defendants argued there is no standing, they were never actually going to rent for us. And the Supreme Court in that case ended up holding um, that there was standing to sue, that this denial of information or this misinformation that they were given was sufficient to establish standing because the purpose of um, the Housing Act was to protect against discrimination and the misinformation was discrimination. So this is the case that the court really keys in on. And then it talks about several other cases uh, subsequent to this that have dealt with disclosure of information. Uh, and then we turn to what Atchison really focuses on, which is a 2019 case, which was TransUnion LLC versus Ramirez. And TransUnion uh, LLC versus Ramirez dealt with the Fair Credit Reporting Act and a group of individuals that were looking at information. And specifically, there was information that was being given to them by the credit agency that was not in the format required by the statute. And the court looked at this and actually concluded that there it wasn't standing for them to sue and said, basically, look, the fact that they're not giving it to you in the exact format, that's not harming you. That's not an injury that is in and of itself a basis for a suit. And then the court went on, and this is really what Atchison keyed in on. Um, after reaching that conclusion, the court included this moreover paragraph and said, moreover, there's not any downstream consequences coming out of uh, this information or this misformatted information. And if you don't have some type of downstream consequence, you don't have standing under Article 3. And that is this language that Atchison talked about that's become more of a conversation in recent years um, and actually has led to the circuit split that makes this case worth talking about today. And the court considered this and considered Atchison's argument about it in this case, but ultimately splitting with several other circuits. So between 2021 and this year, we have the Second Circuit, um, the Fifth Circuit, and the Tenth Circuit have all considered pretty much the same issue. Two of those cases, as I mentioned, Lawfer was actually the plaintiff in those. Um, and those courts looked at TransUnion and that downstream uh, requirement and said, there can't be standing here because there isn't that downstream requirement. She doesn't want to go to the hotel. She's not actually going to take advantage of these services. Uh, but in looking at this case, the First Circuit said, we understand that, we see that, but we don't believe that the three sentences in TransUnion overrules Haven's Realty. And we think Haven's Realty is so directly factually on point that we've got to stick with that. And if the Supreme Court wants to do something different, if this isn't sufficient, then they need to say that we're not going to be the ones to. Um, and they, I mean, that's the biggest and most impactful part of this holding. And they talk some specifically, Atchison raises a few different arguments um, about saying that, you know, this, in this particular case, the lack of representation wasn't discriminatory. The court's just not convinced by that and says, again, the statute is supposed to protect against discrimination. And it says, if you're not giving this information, that is discrimination. So of course it's discriminatory. Um, and then going out from that, they go on to talk about how Atchison also raised a couple of general arguments about particularity and mootness, and the court very quick, quickly dismisses those, but really focuses the bulk of its analysis on the fact that, look, we recognize that this is, and they also, though, do something interesting as well, in that they don't stop by saying, not only um, is this a situation where the informational standing is enough based on Haven's reality. But even if it weren't enough, even if we needed downstream consequences, for Lawfer in this case, she actually has sufficiently established that and talks about the idea of dignitary um, injury and talk in, in the complaint she, which on this motion to dismiss phase, we're looking at everything in the complaint 
in the light most favorable um, to Deborah Laffer. And she says in the complaint that this lack of information made her feel very isolated, uh, very humiliated. And the court says, ultimately, even if we needed downstream consequences, that would actually be enough in this case, which is kind of an interesting, interesting pivot after their language that seems to indicate, hey, we'd be fine if the Supreme Court wants to change this, but we just don't feel like we have the authority to do it. Yeah. Um, so I first want to start off here um, by chastising Anthony for obviously hazing Anna by giving her a standing case on her first short circuit. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> she she was into it. Yeah, I think I think there, I agree. We, had, we had a couple other available, but but she was like, let's, let's do standing. I let's just go for uh, it. <laughs> I think I think the court is right about the standing issue, and I think the real thing that is upsetting about a case like this doesn't have anything to do with standing. It has more to do with the overbreadth of the ADA and potentially in a in a uh, delegation sense, the en- enormous amount of regulation that it's allowed, and obviously. Um, disability access is important, but um, I, you know, if I take off my public interest hat, I, when I was a private litigator in Michigan, had several run-ins um, with these sort of ADA shops, um, and and uh, I, I can't speak to uh, Ms. Lawfer, her attorneys, who, by the way, are in Massachusetts, um, but I can talk in my personal experience about a couple others, and in there are at least a handful of law firms across the country that specialize in these ADA shakedowns. Um, and this is a, a kind of new cyber step that makes them even easier because, you know, Ms., Mrs. Lawford just has to look at a website and now the violations occurred, which is why I think standing is fairly easy here because Congress, through the regulation that the attorney general adopts, has approved the fact that the information on the website itself is the thing that you're owed. And so here she didn't get that. That seems like an injury to me. Whether I would have passed that law or regulation is a separate issue. Um, but the way that this has traditionally worked – is you'll have a law firm and they will find a disabled person or two or a dozen to essentially go to a strip mall and go to every single place. Just go in each store, leave the store, and then they'll follow behind and they'll do all the measurements. And if you've ever looked at the regulations for the ADA, it's impossible to fully comply. We're talking about thousands and thousands of things you have to do, like how many inches off the ground the sink can be, but it can't be too many inches, how much pull weight there has to be on the door, how long the door closes from 90 degrees, a lot of things that will change over time. You know, the hinges of the door will loosen. You have to tighten the door back up. Um, the, the, The handle for flushing the toilet needs to be on the close side instead of the far side, so on and so forth. And so they come in, they'll inevitably find a handful of violations because the sink is one inch too high or something like that. And then they send a demand letter um, based on what they think they can get out of the case to say like, hey, you violated this. We're going to sue you unless you give us $10,000. And a lot of times – But then the interesting thing, right, is you can't get damages, but you can get attorney's fees. Right, which is how you – Perspective relief. Which is, which is how you get the settlement. You, you're thinking of nuisance value. So if you're running a Subway sandwich shop uh, and you have to pay lawyers to defend this ADA case, it might make a lot of sense to just give these people $10,000 to walk away. So they'll take I so sorry to interrupt again, Patrick, but they'll so the law firm in that case will take the ten thousand dollars and not like a binding agreement between their client and the restaurant to make sure that the hinges are properly oiled or whatever it is. Correct. In my experience at least, there will be an ask for certain changes to be made. And usually these restaurants are happy to make the changes. The problem is that the ADA allows the lawsuit without any corrective step before it. So it's not like you have to give them a warning and then they can change it. I think if that were the case, it would work a lot better. Right. Well, and that's a good point because in this and part of what they talk about briefly with that mootness argument is that Atchison itself has now changed its website. And that's what they tried to bring up. Um, the court doesn't spend much time on it because the 13 other websites that they sell through are haven't made those changes yet. But they have tried to comply and they have taken those steps forward. And clearly they would have been willing to probably up front if that had been the conversation. Right. And in every, in every case that I've worked on, and I've only done a handful in private practice, our client immediately offered to change every, fix everything, and that was never enough. It was oh, you know, and, and like I said, the the initial thing would be like, okay, you have to change these things and give us this money, but they would be happy to settle just for the money. Um, and so I do think that this is a very suspect area of the law. Although you know, disability rights are important, I just think the ADA has not struck the correct balance when it comes to this sort of thing. And frankly, I think this is a great case. Um, to illustrate that, because regardless of the standing issue, 
you know, I think a lot of us have looked at websites for hotels and not found information we wanted. And I don't think that was because the hotel was discriminating against us for one, one reason or another. I think it's just because a lot of hotels have really crappy websites. <laughs> that is true. I, I think this is a good this is a good case to kind of test yourself if you maybe believe in um, you know people's right to uh, people's ability to vindicate their rights, but you are suspect of some plaintiffs' lawyers, uh, like you know many more normal people, and even even lawyers off, often are to the, the the kind of tactics that that, that Patrick was talking about, because. He, if if someone in this situation, uh, as Miss Loeffler was in this case, was suing about, um, say, suing the government about some constitutional right or even a statutory right, then a lot of the time courts are going to find her to not have standing. So we at IJ have had many, many cases where we've had lawsuits thrown out on standing and either that sticks or we have to go on appeal and have it reversed where the person had way more going on. Um, than is going on in in this case, and what what helps this case is this this precedent about um, testing that is important for many fights against discrimination that Congress and and legislatures have set up, where the 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 government itself can't do all the enforcement, and so they rely on lawsuits like this to to do that and to do this kind the, the to do this kind of testing because of course if the federal government itself prosecuted this case, standing's not an issue because it's the government and someone's violating the law. Um, and so it, you have to rope this the, the, the standing into that um, uh, that scheme. And so if you're if you're going to have testing, yet you can't have someone ap- actually want to rent all those apartments to do that testing. Um, and so we have this precedent that I it, it sounds like you know, it should be an Article Three injury, and um, uh, in the, under the Constitution, and and the court makes the point about this um, this damage that just by seeing the discrimination, have the discrimination affect the person, that that itself is an injury. But you know that that could be applied and should be applied, I think, in a lot of other areas, um, such as say free speech. So if you have a law that discriminates against your speech. And then you sue about that law, but then the government's like, "Ah, oh, we never enforce that anyway." So, and you were never even going to say that stuff, and so you were never going to like put that sign up or or um, give that um, tour, which we had a case about tour guys that got decided in this way a number of years ago. Um, and so you don't have standing, and courts will buy that. And of course, it's because they're suing the government; they're not suing some small hotel somewhere. Yeah, um, and yeah. and so I just wish that this kind of reasoning was used in in civil rights cases where the government's on the other side, um, then I think things would look a lot different. Yeah, I think I think to kind of bring it back to the the first case and the broader picture is like what you said is totally right, Anthony. You see this issue of standing when it comes to civil rights cases uh, where the court will say, well, it's not clear that you have an injury. Um, but then if you do have an injury, uh, then you can only sue for damages. And now we apply things like qualified immunity. And so just to give <laughs> a little tidbit here um, – There was a case that was just decided by the Sixth Circuit involving a woman who uh, had posts deleted on Facebook that were critical of her local government officials. Um, And she sued, citing some um, policies they had about deleting certain types of comments. And ultimately, the court held that she had no standing because it wasn't clear that she was going to post the sort of comments in the future that would be deleted. Uh, Meanwhile, in an IJ case, Novak versus City of Parma, you had a man who posted on Facebook mocking police and then was arrested for it. And when he sued the police then, after having actually been damaged, the court applied qualified immunity. So it's really damned if you do, damned if you don't. And that's in a sensitive case like the First Amendment and criticism of the government. Um, and so it is, it's very frustrating to see how these doctrines work um, with a special uh, protection when it comes to claims against the government um, that don't apply when you have private litigants. But Patrick, why in the last let's say week or so might people have heard about that case, uh, Novak versus City of Parma? Yeah, you may uh, you may have heard about it, and not even known because uh, Novak versus City of Parma is the case in which the Onion, uh, America's finest news source, uh, maybe <laughs> even the world's, I'm not sure. Uh, they they filed an amicus brief. I believe. 
Yeah, they filed an amicus brief in support of Anthony Novak and the Institute for Justice in our cert petition uh, for that case. So check it out. It's a great brief. I'm guessing it's already the most read legal brief of all time. Uh, but if it, if it, <laughs> it was an enjoyable read. I enjoyed reading that one for but sure. But if it isn't, it will be, I suspect. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with how good the brief is and how boring most legal briefing is. <laughs> well, well, we'll put a link up both to our cert petition in that case and also to the Onions brief, which I'm sure many listeners have, have already seen. Um, one, one final thought on this case. So this is a really in the weeds thing, but um, I saw there was a new parenthetical. So many of you know, in the last few years, there's been an innovation in quoting from past cases in a current case where you put this in the parenthetical afterward and you put cleaned up. Where you, you you don't have to put like all these quote marks and ellipses and and quote marks and side of quote marks that often make text a little bit unreasonable when un, un, unreadable and maybe unreasonable when you're quoting them, <laughs> but you just put cleaned up. This one said cleaned up, comma then a new alteration added, which uh, I haven't seen before. But to me, it kind of makes it you know like I don't know what's real at that point. We're moving in the wrong direction either way. I mean, if the point yeah. of cleaned up was to make it more succinct, I, I do I do feel now that I have uh, the right to point out that the uh, Supreme Court case I argued, Brownback versus King, resulted in the United States Supreme Court's first use of the parenthetical cleaned up. That's so, right. So there you go. There you go. Anna, you, you are the most you. We all clerked, but uh, Patrick and I, I believe, clerked before the cleaned up era. I definitely did. Um, was cleaned up a thing in your chambers when you were recently? No, clerking? cleaned up hadn't made it, but I, I like cleaned up. I think I'm gonna save it and try it out. But um, no, it, that was not something we were still. And it does. It gets so bulky sometimes when you're trying to say, you know, citations omitted and you leave things out. So I think, I think cleaned up could be a helpful innovation. I don't think the cleaned up alteration added is one that I would recommend. But yeah, I'm a big, I like the cleaned. I'm up. a big fan of cleaned up because at the end of the day, when you have a parenthetical that says something like citation and quotation marks omitted, emphasis added, uh, internal citations omitted. Now it's nobody even knows what it would have looked like anyhow. So let's just say cleaned up and they can go to the source document if they really need to see exactly what it looked like. Well, uh, on that note, uh, we're going to go uh, clean up this podcast uh, as, as anyone does. Uh, take, take out a few of the um, awkward pauses uh, that one has. Uh, nothing awkward between us today, though. Uh, this has been uh, this has been a wonderful uh, discussion about uh, these couple cases. If you're in the New York City area, again, check out Short Circuit Live so you can come meet Patrick in person, but not Anthony. in a couple weeks. Not Anthony. I'll be there. He will not. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I have to wait for another time uh, for for that. And thank you, Anna, for coming on for the uh, the very first time. And we should give a shout out uh, because we were talking about cleanup that Jack Metzler. Uh, who's a, a D.C. Uh, area lawyer. He is the one who first came up with the the cleaned up um, uh, ellipse or not, uh, parenthetical. And I remember when your case came out, Patrick, he was absolutely ecstatic that uh, that it made it to SCOTUS and as he should be. <laughs> well, thank you, guys. And thank everyone for listening. Um, in the meantime, I hope that all of you get engaged. Mm-hmm.